Hey guys, it's me again. Yes, that's right. This voice you're hearing right now, it's not a hallucination or anything. It's my voice. I'm back after all these months. And before I get started on today's subject, I first want to apologize for being gone for all these months. I've been busy with both my other channel because that's my main channel, and I've been busy with other things during the transition of years. Speaking of which, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year from then. But alas, now that we've got that out of the way, today I want to talk about the idea of the separation between church and state. The separation of church and state is an idea that has been commonly used to argue against socially conservative ideas, because as we know, a lot of those ideas are inspired from religion. However, there is a massive misunderstanding as to what this term means, and its actual meaning doesn't contradict religious-based social conservatism. So in today's video, I am going to mostly touch on two things. One, I am going to talk about what the separation of church and state really meant when it was created, and then I am going to talk about its misuse in Australia. I'll also mention a bit about its misuse in America, since that is when the term was first used. So I'll start by explaining the true definition of the separation of church and state. The problem with using the separation of church and state as an argument against religious-based policies is that it suggests the definition of the term is that religion should have no influence on policy making. But this definition is inaccurate. And the funny thing is, not only is the term not mentioned in the United States Constitution, it didn't even exist until a couple of decades after the Constitution was written. You see, the term was first used by Thomas Jefferson in a letter in 1802, who referred to it as a wall of separation of church and state. I'll first read the letter itself and then explain its context. The letter reads, Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that the act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. And as we know, when he says, make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise of it, he is quoting the First Amendment of the Constitution. But when he wrote this letter to the Baptists, who I believe wanted a national church, he wasn't saying that legislation shouldn't be religious based. He was saying that the idea of a state church is unconstitutional. And that is what he referred to as the separation of church and state. And this is a correct interpretation of the First Amendment, because as we said before, it says that the government should not establish a religion, nor should it infringe on religious freedom. And there is a big difference between having a state religion and having legislation that's inspired from religion. A state religion is a religion that is specifically endorsed by the government. And once again, that does not mean that legislatures were not allowed to have legislation that was inspired by faith. In fact, if anything, the founding fathers who wrote this idea into the constitution supported the contrary. Another founding father and the fourth president of the United States, James Madison, stated, Because if religion be exempt from the authority of the society at large, still less can it be subject to that of the legislative body. And he too was a supporter of what Thomas Jefferson called the separation of church and state. Not to mention that US dollars literally say, in God we trust on them, and although this only started showing in 1864, so the Founding Fathers themselves didn't decide on it, the Supreme Court interpreted that this statement was not unconstitutional. So I think I've made my case. The term separation of church and state does not mean that legislation shouldn't be inspired by religion. Instead, it means that the government should not establish a state religion. I just wanted to talk about its case in America because that is when the term was first used, but now I want to talk about its use in Australia, because after all, this is an Australian page. 
and in Australia it's the same case. Jefferson's idea of the separation of church and state is described in section 116 of the Australian Constitution, which reads, The Commonwealth shall not make any law for establishing any religion or for imposing any religious observance, which means to make any religion mandatory, or for prohibiting the free exercise of any religion, and no religious test shall be required as a qualification for any office or public trust under the Commonwealth. But once again, it only says that the state should not establish any state religion or make any religion mandatory. Just like in the United States Constitution, and in what Thomas Jefferson defined as the separation of church and state, the Australian Constitution doesn't say that legislation should not have inspiration from religion. And like James Madison in America, the father of Australian Federation, Sir Henry Parks, thought the contrary to this. We are, as in we Australians, are preeminently a Christian people, as our laws our whole system of jurisprudence, our constitution, are based on and interwoven with our Christian belief. It's very clear that Henry Parks, the leading figure of Australian Federation, despite the fact that he never lived to see it, supported the idea of legislation and government having inspiration from religion, specifically Christianity. So now we've established that the separation of church and state does permit, if not encourage, religious-based legislation. That said, before I end off today's video, I do want to give some advice. Let's say you're in a debate about something on a social issue. I would recommend that you try and avoid using faith as your main argument, because of course not everyone is religious, and therefore religion is not going to convince everyone. So definitely have it as a reason for your views, but also try and find more secular ones. But now that we know what the separation of church and state really means, I'll end today's video off here. Once again, I apologise for being gone for a while, and I will see you guys in the next video.